One of the great things about being a freelance photographer in the last 30 years, or even a little longer than that, is that occasionally your phone would ring and you'd get a phone call from an editor who would offer you a story on a place that you had never heard of and about a people that you knew nothing about. And it was like a ticket to adventure. And so I got one of those phone calls in late 1978 from the Time Magazine picture editor who had been, the magazine had been uh, in the course of putting together a story on Baluchistan. And neither the editor nor I really knew where that was. Uh, he called me into his office and he said, we would like you to go to Baluchistan. And I said, great, where is that? And he said, I don't know, but let's go find out. So then we wandered over to a big map and we found that it's this province in the west of Pakistan bordering against Iran and Afghanistan. And I spent two weeks there in the fall of 78. And when I left, I, I had been hearing over the course of that autumn that there had been demonstrations in uh, Tehran, that there had been, uh, in September, a day in which several hundred people had been killed in an anti-Shah demonstration. I'd heard that Ayatollah Khomeini was in exile in France. Didn't really know so much about it, but it was on the way home. So I stopped in Tehran on uh, the day after Christmas thinking I would maybe stay just a couple of days and see what was going on. But I dumped my gear at the hotel and went out with a, uh, one of the AP photographers that afternoon, immediately found myself in this shooting protest down in Esfahan Square. And I realized that this, this really was a story. This wasn't just something you were going to read about in a wire dispatch. And I decided to stay a little while longer. And once you get into a story, sometimes the story grabs hold of you in a way that you can't really let go of it. So I ended up staying through the final days of the Shah. I saw the last public appearances of the Shah in Iran. His departure, Khomeini's return, and the flip of the government in February as uh, the uh, Khomeini forces took power. Well, I spent 44 days in Iran during the revolution. That's the title of my book. I knew very quickly that it was a big deal. From the day I arrived in Tehran, I was working with the Time Magazine Stringer, who happened to be, very fortuitously, the AP bureau chief. And the AP guys are always plugged in. They have their own stringers that are out there, people calling from pay phones, and it's true, it was long before mobile phones even were a dream. People would phone the office, and if you happened to be in the office, or maybe at the hotel, and you'd call the office just to see what's going on, and you'd get your first idea of where something would be happening. You'd get in a car and you'd go there. And then from then on, it was just kind of following your nose for the rest of the day. I shot the Iranian Revolution with two AE-1s, prime lenses. They didn't, none of the fast zooms even existed yet. Those AE-1s were like a breakthrough camera. When I changed over to Canon in early 1978, it was the era of the, the good heavy ring breech lock silver ring lenses. and. The F1s were beautiful, but I found them to be a little bit heavy, and the AE-1 was wonderful. It was, it was lightweight, and it had a bright viewfinder, and you could carry it all day, or several of them all day, and not be completely tired out by it. People have no idea in the digital world when it's so easy to just download your pictures, take your card, download it to your laptop, hook up to an internet connection, and send your pictures anywhere in the world. Uh, in 1979, we still were shooting film. I was shooting Kodachrome. I shot the whole revolution on Kodachrome and Tri-X. And it meant that we had to get almost every day. There would be occasionally a day when we'd skip shipping. But I went with my colleague Olivier Rabot from Newsweek. Um, every morning at 6 o'clock, we'd get up early and drive to the airport. And because the civil authority had kind of melted away, there was nothing to stop you from just walking into the departure lounge. And there would be this sort of ragtag group, mainly foreigners, who were trying to get out and get home either to France or England or in some cases the U.S. And we would kind of sit at the edge of the room and try and figure out, all right, who do you think is going to take the film? That guy looks like he might do it. This guy never will. And then about three quarters of the time we'd be right. We'd go and ask them uh, if we could... We had to make a pretty good case for it. We'd try and really make it sound like the whole future of Western civilization relied on these films being delivered to somebody in Paris or London or New York. And it was, as Blanche Dubois used to say in Streetcar Named Desire, we always relied on the kindness of strangers. After Khomeini returned to 
uh, Tehran and had set up his office in this school. After very persistent nagging of this press officer, instead of being outside with this crowd of 20,000 people and seeing Khomeini come to the window, I was in the school, in the quiet little room, and all that noise was outside on the other side of the glass. And for me, those pictures probably are the most, uh, maybe the most meaningful. And, and there's, you know, there's a couple of single images. There's a whole contact sheet from that. Uh, there's one roll of film that is just an amazing roll of film that has four or five pictures in it that really uh, get you inside that, that moment where Khomeini was starting to uh, exercise his power. And, and, a, and this, another one of these pictures that you never really know at the time how important it is, but uh, he's putting his teacup back on a tray that's being held by Ayatollah Kalkali, who I didn't have any idea at the time who it was, but within a few months he became known as the hanging judge of the revolutionary courts and ordered thousands of people killed and very quickly established a reputation for being pretty ruthless. Here he is serving tea to Khomeini in this very quiet little moment. So sometimes these visual ironies take, take on a, a weight and a power that at the time you have no idea what's going on. At one point, uh, Khomeini decided to have a press conference. I had brought a few rolls of tungsten film and uh, I had a 200 millimeter 2.8 lens with a 1.4 converter. So I was shooting at 280 at f4 and I kind of really went tight. And it's amazing, it was not, it's not really very elegant light, but there is something just in the force of his, of his face and the, just that look that he had without any effort that made that picture. This one photograph of uh, people running after, basically, it's a study and what happens when gunshots go off and how people react to them. And it's so interesting because you'll see some people are in full run and others are just kind of sauntering and some people are maybe not even running at all. And to me it's, it's kind of very reflective of what happens in a crowd because people don't always react the same way. The photograph of the man at the demonstration who's with a very stoic look on his face and a number of snapshots of atrocities from the, the committed by the Savak, the secret police. There's something, there's a power in, in the, the face of this guy and that he knows why he's there, that he's kind of this billboard for uh, protest. And, and it's interesting because I have a picture of him both from behind and from in front. And, uh, the one from behind kind of sets up the other picture. It almost makes you wonder what it's about. And then the second picture where he's looking right into the camera is a really, I think, a very strong picture. As a photographer, you can't photograph every fact. Very often you have to photograph something that is an intimation or a feeling or an emotion or a, or a visual emotion. And for us, the, uh, the Shador, the black dress that women were wearing, became in many ways the symbol of the revolution. And the, and the photography uh, side of it, those photographs really started to become a very symbolic element of pictorially of what the revolution was about. You know, after 30 years, you see that uh, this first of the great Islamic revolutions was a precursor of so much which has happened in the Middle East and with all the changes that have happened, there was a lot of it that was given away by what happened in those months. You know, it's funny, when you, when you try and compare the pictures from June of 09 with 1979, there are what seem to be a lot of parallels in terms of the people in the street and the big manifestations of, of protest. And to me, the great irony is that many of the people who I was photographing in the street in 1979 essentially became the people who were now trying to keep the lid on it and keep the demonstrations from taking place and if there were demonstrations to keep those pictures from going anywhere. So many of the pictures from the same locations almost you could almost interchange my picture and, and the current pictures and uh, there's very little difference so sometimes history plays little games with you and you kind of wonder you know which was that 79 or 2009